I'm Pat Bozeman, head of special collections, and I want to welcome you all here tonight. Thank you for coming. Um, I want to especially thank our guest panelists, Mrs. Jeanette Cliff George and Mr. Charles Crum, for being with us this evening. I would also like to uh, give a special shout out for the actors and staff who are here from the Allen Theater, AD Players, and the UH School of Theater and Dance. Nine of Ants was a force for creativity. Obviously, she was creative in the sense that she was an actress, director, and a theatrical producer. She was creative in that she sketched, she wrote, and she lectured. And although the original idea to establish the Alley Theater was not hers, she was responsible for nearly every major financial and artistic decision that was made um, at the that guided the theater's early development until it, it exceeded everyone's ambitions, save her own. She has been quoted as saying that she clawed this theater out of the very ground. <laughs> <laughs> but beyond these more straightforward acts of invention, she created Nine of Ants, one of the most magnificent characters in the history of Houston's cultural scene. She was born Nina Eloise Whittington in the small town of Yokum, Texas on October 22nd, 1914, 100 years and two days ago. Stacy and I have not been able to determine whether when she was born her name was pronounced Nina or Nina, but I like to think she was born in plain old Nina Eloise in small town Texas and changed the pronunciation as a youthful act of self-determination. <laughs> And please don't disabuse me of this because my father says you should never let the facts get in the way of a good story. <laughs> her position as the First Lady of Houston Theater is all the more remarkable when one considers her very limited experience before the hour. She studied drama at Texas Christian University and elsewhere, including at the American Academy of Dramatic Art. Uh, sorry, I'm the art library. At the American Academy of Dramatic Art. She came to Houston in 1939 to work as the high school drama teacher at a couple of high schools, and she volunteered in a couple of community theaters. She also directed plays for two years at the Jewish Community Center. Vivian Altfeld, one of the actresses she directed at the JCC, decided to maximize the value of a dance studio she owned on Main Street by establishing a theater company that would use the space in the evenings, and she and her husband asked Miss Banks to run it for them. Under the direction of this young woman of limited experience, the Alley Theater evolved at a breakneck pace. Voting membership at the Alley Theater only cost 10 cents, and many of the company members expected the Alley to be nothing more than an enjoyable hobby for working people looking for some theatrical diversion in the evening. Nine events, however, had other ideas. The play she selected often challenged audiences and courted internal controversy. She convinced famous actors to appear at the Alley's modest second location, which was a small converted fan factory, uh, which you see in the photograph above. In three years, it mounted its first Broadway-bound world premiere. In five years, it was a semi-professional regional theater company. In seven years, it joined Equity. And in ten years, it was invited by the State Department to represent American regional theater at the World's Fair in Brussels. Night of Ants, oh, and this is our favorite picture because it looks so cool. Uh, <laughs> Night of Ants was closely associated with the Alley Theater, not simply as its chief executive, but almost as its personification. People remember her as intelligent, so glamorous, sensitive, ambitious, and amusing. We hear these words a lot when we're talking to people about her, reading her letters and diaries. And those same letters and diaries, which are housed here in the special collections department of this library, give the impression of an iron fist that's been sheathed in a meek glove. Alley Company members became her social network. The three Alley Theater buildings became her natural environment. She quickly became the clever and colorful character, Ms. Maya Vance. She built a theater powerhouse and elevated the stature of American regional theater in the 20th century, and she can claim a great deal of credit for establishing Houston as a world-class artistic center. And now, I shall invite two of the brightest stars to ever appear on the Alley stage to uh, speak.
speak with my fellow curator, Stacey Lavender, on the panel up front. Jeanette Cliff George, on the far right, um, was a leading lady, and one might even say the leading lady, at the Alley Theater for many years. Notable roles include leads in Romeo and Juliet, Colette, The Crime of Miss Jean Brody. She starred in one film, The Hiding Place, for which she was nominated for a Golden Globe Award by the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, perhaps you've heard of it, uh, a Golden Apple Award by the Hollywood Women's Press Club, and Most Promising Newcomer by the British Academy of Arts and Sciences, which is my personal favorite, because of course at that point she had been working as a professional actress for years. Um, Ms. George founded the AD Players in 1967, right? and continues to serve as the artistic director of that theater on West Alabama. If you've not been, you should go. She is a well-known, she's also well-known as a playwright, book author, and Bible teacher of national reputation. Charles Crone, whom I remember loving in many productions in Herman Park throughout my life, uh, is in his 28th season at the Alley Theater. He has played roles in a great number of plays, including Amadeus, uh, August Osage County, Our Town, and the Farnsworth Convention. He has toured the U.S. in the Best Little Warehouse in Texas, and locally has appeared at Theater Lab, Stages Repertory Theater, and with the Houston Shakespeare Festival, and Theater of the Stars. And when he is not on stage, this is all more remarkable, he is a professor of English at the University of St. Louis. Uh, thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Charles and Jeanette, for being here, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I'm just going to dive right into some questions, because I know it's going to be a pretty short panel. Um, first, uh, I'd like to ask, uh, since you both had opportunities to work with Nine Advance, what was your first impression of her, both as a person and as a director? <laughs> no, I know. Well, by the way, the, the introduction, I certainly appreciate that. We both appreciate it. But it should have been your genetic. And then there's Charles Crow. Okay. Anyway. Um, yeah, I met Nina through a mutual friend of ours, Jay Moody. Whom, of course, Jeanette knows very well. Very well. Um, and it was uh, at a party at Che's house, and uh, I found myself in a gathering that was, that included night events. The now, even then, this is a long time ago. This would have been back in the, uh, uh, I guess, when I first knew her, it would be about nineteen. 54, I guess, was my first year. I knew off of Maybe I should have swallowed the brain. Okay. Yes. Um, and she, well, she was uh, a formidable woman, but a very winning one that is very approachable. She was an imposing person, a personality. Uh, but she was also uh, a kind person and also had a marvelous sense of humor. I mean, one of the best things I could think of saying about Nina is that uh, she never took herself seriously, but she took her work very seriously. It was all about the work, not about her. And that kind of ambition, a word she uses, by the way, in a posted interview. And she says, I, my ambitions, and she says, I use that word, and I don't apologize for it. Because that's what it took to send you know, 200 postcards, to get a 50% response from the 200 postcards. It's amazing in itself. And I think encouraged by that response, uh, she became uh, the theatrical force uh, in Houston. And without her, uh, theater in Houston wouldn't be what it is uh, today. So I liked her a lot. I enjoyed her company. And she was a good person. Jeanette, what were your first impressions of Nanny Banks? My first impressions of Nina 
were decorated by the fact that she had a theater. I, I had been in, in New York. I came to Houston when my father died, and I, her theater was then not in her own place. It was in a building downtown, and I think it was on one floor that you got up to have the theater. And uh, In the dance studio? The dance studio on Main, probably. It, yeah. Well, it, it was... It, it was not a separate theater. It was a part of the, it was a theater. Yeah, 86 people. Uh -huh. yeah. And to meet the person who had brought forth that theater was just awesome to me. And we got down, and I, I didn't know how long I was going to be here because I was just coming for that space of time. And I, uh, she talked to me, and... Uh, asked me if I would do a cold reading for her. I'd never heard the words before. I didn't know how cold they were. I could describe <laughs> change the sweater. That would it describes help. the audience. And, and I didn't know what it was. And she gave me a, a copy, the script that came from their library. was, uh, And I read it. And she said, we want you to be in our theater. And I said, I want to be <laughs> in your theater. Is, is that the way it happens? <laughs> and she went in and told the people at the box office she had just auditioned the perfect cold reader. That's when you don't know anything about other than the lines that you give. So she brought me in, and we started working, and it was, uh, I'd been with the company, I think, about 20 years before I told them that the cold reader, cold reading script she had presented happened to have been my acting final at the University of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I don't think honesty should ever overcome good opportunity. <laughs> I love Nina. She had a way, her directing was very specific. And she, she would walk with the actors, not on stage, but follow them around the stage and interrupt with her helpfulness. And I was very grateful. Uh, she, she experienced the actor. Few directors do this. Yes. But she experienced the actor. So her direction sometimes sharp, uh, came in immediate practice. And I think I learned from her something that right now is the first time I realized it. You have to put what you learn into practice. Our learning is an empty sack. I still get there. I got it from her. You put what you're learning into practice. And I think that has been part of the hub of my whole field of theater. That learning is not to give you a gold key and a star. It's to take it out on the stage where it belongs to be played. I have uh, I've loved theater since I was 15 years old and went to the circus. The circus was as close as I could get to theater, so I stayed in that and then I got into theater and Nina by her diligence and her determination <laughs> if she had determined that you were going to play that role correctly you might as well give up because she's going to see to it that you, that you did. <laughs> I love Nina. I'm very appreciative of the time she gave us. I never felt and maybe this is I never felt our time together was interruptible. But whether it was work on a scene, work on the script, whatever it was, it had rain in that time. Not this kind of rain, but ruling. Yeah. And it was real. And I, I loved her. I am very grateful to her. Her sense of humor uh, was sometimes concealed because she was trying to cover it over something you were learning that was very serious. And then afterwards, you could realize that little giggle 
yes. that she tried to cover. <laughs> meant the sense of humor was celebrating. I, I loved her dearly. And for me to be here with you, I'm, this is awesome. <laughs> and uh, I just appreciate that. I appreciate theater. I believe theater is necessary. Most of us get into it because we like it. I've never known anybody to be forced into theater. No, no. I don't think so. <laughs> never known a parent that said, I want you to go into theater. You know? <laughs> and we're in. Cause it, and, and she honored it. She, she honored the whole process of theater. The whole process had her involvement and her attention. And she stayed with the actor until he brought what she had taught on stage. She so told me one little phrase, go on. That means nothing. But if you're a scared young person, afraid of the audience, wondering why in the world you ever got yourself into that, and the lights have come on, Hearing two words go on. I also relate those two words <coughs> to the exercise of ambition. Go on. Theater is a composite of people that have dared to go on. And I was one of them. Thank you, that was wonderful. Um, you actually sort of, this segues really well into my second question. You kind of answered it, uh, Jeanette. I was going to ask what was your uh, favorite piece of advice that Nine Advance gave you, and I thought that was a really uh, lovely piece of advice, uh, advice um, that learning isn't like an empty sack, it's something you have to use. Um, well, Charles, did you have oh, a favorite sure, piece of advice yeah, from uh, Nine Advance? Yeah, she, uh, yes. My first uh, role at the alley was as this young, self-important artist in a play by Google Betty called The Queen and the Rebels. And um, I think it was the first or second day of rehearsal and I was busy acting. <laughs> really acting. And she, you know, she was doing some note, and she took me aside and said, Charles, yes, don't. <laughs> Probably the best piece of advice I've ever received. <laughs> but she, she followed that, and this is her a virtual mantra. She said, and more than once she has said, I'm sure Jeanette has heard it, she says, acting is reacting. Mm -hmm. And that goes along with the very principle that Jeanette was talking about. It's not about one person. It's not about me. It's about us, them. And so acting then becomes, in a sense, easy because the burden is taken off you and all you have to do is react to what the other person, the other actor, the other character is uh, saying to you. So that sort of series of, of prompts, of, of cues, of uh, suggestions, and sparkling, sparking something into action is what I learned. Uh, it's one of the main things, one of the better things I learned from her is this notion of, of, of reacting. Okay, we have just a couple more minutes, so I'm going to ask one more question. Um, it's not the kind of question that you can give a short answer to, but we'll try. Um, how has the Alley Theater, in your opinion, impacted the cultural growth of the city of Houston? Would you repeat that once Yes. How has the Alley Theater impacted the cultural growth of Houston as a city? Without it, I don't think the end of your sentence would ever have been. <laughs> she, she also believed the arts, particularly theater, 
were contagious, that if you offered them correctly, their theme and their matter and their practice would be caught by the people that had watched it happen. I still, I still find that she was an encourager. Oh yes. And she, <laughs> uh, she was loving and kind and did not find it necessary to shield the truth of her criticisms. No. <laughs> it was, she was kind and loving, and when she criticized, it was extremely clear, and you were comforted by knowing she was kind and loving. <laughs> That's right. I, I'm impressed by the choice of theater that she brought in. Uh, she, we, we played a variety of styles. I didn't know that was unusual until I got to other theaters, but she she saw theater as its own bag of differences and played them yeah. with that. And uh, Well, the very fact that she, once she moved over to 709 Berry Street, which was only two, uh, I think it's a block and a half from where the dance studio Yes. When they moved there, you know, she had this fan factory and they built an arena stage. And Margot Jones, her friend and a colleague of sorts, actually, kind of, I'm sorry, kind of mentions that she was uh, one of her first jobs in the theater was sweeping floors for Margot Jones' theater here in Houston. And Margot's uh, influence on her, that, uh, you know, that, uh, it can be done. The audience, which I'm obviously in an arena theater, surrounds the actors. And I think if you talk to most actors, they really love acting in a, an arena theater. They love the fact that they'll see the audience's faces. And the audience's faces in the South can see the audience's faces in North, and West can see the audience's faces in East. Becomes then a community, a, gen a genuine community that has grown out of theater, but especially in this particular case, Nine Events's love of theater and her her compulsion and her, uh, her determination, as Jeanette says, is uh, what in effect changed the theatrical face uh, of Houston. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think that's all of our time. Uh, thank you both so much for being here tonight and talking a little bit about Night Advance. Um, and if you guys will all join us, we're going to have a toast in just a few minutes. I think champagne will be coming around. Um, so, thank you. Thank you. You always need to know when theater comes into action. It's for people. Yeah. And we thank you. <laughs>